Well, hey, Radiant, hey, Church. It's, uh, it's good to have a few people from Deer Valley here tonight. And there you go. It's good to have, good to have a few people from Sun City as well. Uh, we love you guys. Thankful for you. Good to, good to have you if you're watching online with us tonight. And uh, why don't you just turn to your neighbor and tell them the Holy Spirit is already working. Holy Spirit's already working. And thankful that you're here tonight. Listen, church, this is the, uh, it's the most important service of the week. And I, I truly believe that, that what happens uh, during the rest of this week, what happens on Sunday mornings is a result of the prayers that we pray, of the, the moments that we just spend seeking the Lord. And I believe that there's some people in the room tonight that you're gonna have an encounter with God like you never had before. And uh, I'm just encouraged that you're here tonight, so thank you for being here. Uh, we have a special guest with us tonight, and um, uh, known him, I, I think, actually, my dad told me that he stayed in our house when I was like five, so uh, you're, you look like a young man, though, Sean, but but uh, I'm just a little bit younger. Um, but <laughs> what I do know is he was, he was doing youth camps long before I was ever in youth camp here in Arizona, and so he's, uh, he's a friend to Arizona, and he's, he's been ministering here for years, uh, and, and I'm not gonna tell you how many years, but a few years, and, uh, and I'm just very thankful. And, and what, I, what I'm thankful for about, about Sean is that uh, I just believe that God, that, that he has a fresh word every time um, that I've, I've been around him and heard him and uh, is just sensitive to the Holy Spirit's voice. And, 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 and I believe that he has a word for us tonight that's just gonna be encouraging and powerful. And so I would just ask you tonight, would you just open your heart and would you just, uh, just ask God even right now, Lord, speak to me tonight. God, give me an encounter with you like I've never had before tonight. And so, uh, church, with, with, uh, without further ado, would you just welcome Sean Smith as he comes to share with us tonight? I love you, man. Thanks so much. Radiant Church, how you guys doing? Awesome. I'm telling you what, for this many people to come out on a Wednesday night prayer meeting, I was just talking to Dan, I'll introduce him in a second, and just saying, oh my God, this is so amazing. Like, this is really a reflection of the strength and the power of this house. I just want to say, man, first of all, I, just, I, I am so blessed to be with you guys. I actually knew Caden before. Caden was Caden. Uh, his, his dad and mom, Lee and Jody, we go back to the 80s. That's like a VH1 special for those of you that are. When, when you're saying old, old school and you're saying old school is like the old hundreds, that ain't old school. You ain't old enough to say what old school. You got to go at least back to the 80s, 70s, right, for it to be old school. But I do remember coming to these camps, and uh, I remember uh, obviously seeing Caden grow up. But to, to see he and Hope uh, take over the leadership of this house, to know them and see them. I've been out here before for them, for their young adults, and to see their passion to see their wisdom, to see their vision. If I would have that kind of stuff when I was their age, I'd be totally scary. But it took me a couple more decades to get it. You guys are blessed to have them as leaders. It is ser seriously, right? You, you agree with me? Caden picked uh, Dan and I up in the car, and I was just talking to him, and, and I, was, I was just getting chill bumps. I was like, oh, my God. Like, you are so God's person uh, he and hope for this house. I've got Dan Levy with me. He's one of the campus pastors at my home church, uh, a new life uh, in the Bay Area, Dublin, California. So, Dan, would you stand up? Everybody see you. This is Dan right here, mighty man of God. I'm going to give out a couple things because I want to dive right in this. I've uh, written a book on revival entitled I Am Your Sign. Uh, I believe, I, I, okay, let me just say it. I believe that the whole pandemic was a fast track to harvest. That's what I believe. You ever been to Disneyland, Disney World? They got to give you a fast track pass so you don't have to wait three hours to get on Indiana Jones, right? You can wait maybe 10, 15 minutes. I believe that the pandemic, not that God sent the virus, but he can use every season. I believe that God allowed the pandemic as a fast track to get the church back to the place where she was hungry for what really mattered to get a world out there desperate for an anchor in the midst of a storm. And when you get that kind of spiritual hunger intersecting with that type of desperation, let me tell you what, in past history, you have revivals breaking out. So I've written a book. I cover about 40 different revivals, outpourings, and awakenings. Uh, and so the best way I can say it is 
my prayer is that this would not be an easy reading. You know, you, you want to sit down and have coffee and read through it real quick. I'm asking God that this book would wreck you. You would cry out for revival. You would be ruined for ordinary Christianity. And I'm going to give this to you, sis, because you're lifting your hand up. I don't know if I should toss it. You're going to help me out if I can. Oh, bless your heart. God bless you. There you go. Sure, absolutely. You're a teacher. You're going to read. Oh, come on. That's awesome. And I've, uh, my first book I ever wrote was Prophetic Evangelism. Our, our uh, editor came to me, and I want to do this quick, said, would you re re-release it, meaning they would slap a new cover on it and uh, release it. And I said, no. <laughs> I said, I want you to slap a new cover. I want to rewrite this thing because I first wrote it in 2004. So I just re-released it. I took out 60% of the old book, wrote 60 new. Uh, when I wrote Prophetic Evangelism before, I was fighting for the theology and viability of it. Now, I wanted to write a book that would get someone off the couch, off of, you know, sipping their latte and at Starbucks, prophesying over the barista, praying for somebody over in the corner, and revival breaks out at the local Starbucks. Come on. Prophetic evangelism is, uh, the best way I can describe it, is supernatural soul winning. It's letting God speak to you and direct you, because I believe that there are many people right now that are hungry and, and ready. And so I hope I'm going to give this to you. You're, I know you're a good catch. I can just tell you. Oh, look at that catch. All right. All right. You got a Bible? I got other stuff out there. I don't want to talk about it all, but uh, you can stop by the table, and I'd love to see y'all come out there as well. Uh, if you have a Bible, go to Luke chapter 5. Luke chapter 5, and I want to read this and uh, open this up real quickly. It says in Luke chapter 5, in verse, uh, let's start at verse 17. It says, now it happened on a certain day as he was teaching that there were Pharisees and teachers of the law sitting by who had come out of every town of Galilee, Judea, and Jerusalem. And the power of the Lord was present to heal them. Then behold, men brought on a bed a man who was paralyzed, whom they sought to bring in and lay before him. And when they could not find out how they might bring him in because of the crowd, they went up on the housetop and let him down with his bed through the tiling or roof into the midst before Jesus. When he saw their faith, he said to them, man, your sins are forgiven you. And the scribes and the Pharisees began to reason. Some might say, uh-oh. Oh, you guys are awesome. Saying, who is this who speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? But when Jesus perceived their thoughts, he answered and said to them, why are you reasoning in your hearts? Which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven you, or to say, rise up and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. He said to the man who was paralyzed, I say to you, arise, take up your bed and go to your house. Immediately he rose up before him, took up what he had been lying on and departed to his own house. Now jump to Mark 2. This is a parallel or synoptic gospel. I just want to read one verse out of Mark 2. And if you don't get there, I just read it. It says in Mark 2, 1, it says, And again he entered Capernaum after some days, and it was heard that he was in the house. Immediately many gathered together, so there was no longer room to receive him, not even near the door. And he preached the word to them. Recently, I was on the East Coast. I think I was in the New Jersey area, and uh, we were doing a conference, my wife and I, and as we were out doing this conference, uh, we had a break in between, and so my wife pitched the idea, and I was down with it. Let's go check out their mall, right? So we Ubered it. So we got this Uber driver, and he comes up, and as always, whenever I'm in a position where whether it's an Uber driver or I'm in a restaurant or whatever, I'm always saying, God, what do you have for this person in front of me? God, do you want to encourage them? Do you want to speak to them? Do you want to heal them? Is there an opportunity of something I could pray for them? And so all of a sudden, this Uber driver comes, and he has a big old, I mean, when I say big old, relatively big. It's not blocking his entire windshield. But he has this big old uh, Dominican Republic flag right below his rearview mirror in a car. And so I thought, oh, connection point, because I'm always trying to start conversation. And I go, hey, man, you from the DR, Dominican Republic. Goes, yeah, yeah, what do you know about the DR, he says to me. And I said, hey, I have my honeymoon at the DR. We went to Punta Cana. And so he's, we're talking about that. And it was so funny because I had a total flashback about my, uh, uh, you know, honeymoon. And, and I want to break it down. I was born and raised in inner city Oakland. And so I need to give a disclaimer here. I don't like stereotypes, and I certainly don't like to play into generalizations but what I'm telling you is true, so I'm just going to keep it real. When I grew up in my neighborhood, we didn't like water, okay? I mean, I grew up in Northern California, Oakland. 
we had a pool, and the pool eventually closed down because in my neighborhood, nobody knew how to swim, right? Like, when it was open, it was all these inner city kids, and we were all on the kiddie side. Like, you could have swam laps on the other side, partially because many of us, we didn't have dads around or uncles, so I didn't have an uncle to teach me how to swim because he didn't have an uncle to teach him how to swim. So I didn't really like water, and then I'm going to date myself on this one. They came out with some sort of, like, shark movie, Jaws or something like that, and I'm living right there where people are getting bit consistently, and I'm like, oh, heck no, I ain't getting up in no water. I do not like water. So I determined right there I didn't like water, right? And, 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 and so I'm not trying to say, oh, black people don't like water, okay? I'm just saying that next time you see an African-American go towards the dunk tank to be water baptized, y'all need to clap louder because they overcame. They, uh, we shall overcome. Come on, somebody. The second thing I didn't like is I didn't like heights. And I don't know where that really came from. I think in my neighborhood, some kid fell off something. Urban legend had it. And all of a sudden, his head rolled off and he died and, you know, all that stuff. So I, I really wouldn't go much higher than Mrs. Jones Plum Tree. In the hood, Mrs. Jones had a nice plum tree. It wasn't that high, but I would climb in her tree just to get plums because we wanted it, and that was our snacks, you know, so we would go for it. So fast forward. When I went on my honeymoon, I was determined that I was going to do things that literally would tear the lid off the way I grew up. So we're in Punta Cana, and so here's what we did. Y'all ready for this? We zip line, somebody said, uh-oh, we zip line a mile high over a canyon, 60 miles per hour. I'm screaming the entire way. If, if it was, uh, y'all are awesome, y'all applauding. They didn't have a net. Like, like in the United States, you'd be a lawsuit, litigation. You, you cannot do that. There's no net. If I fall, I fall, right? And so I'm screaming the entire way. We're in water. We're in water, and I am petting sharks. Hello, Jaws, Roy Snyder, whatever the actor's name is. And I'm not, talking, I'm not talking about I was in a cage and the shark was out in the pool or the shark was in a cage. No, no, the shark was in the water with me and they told us, see my voice cracked thinking about it. They told us they sanded down the shark's teeth, but we just had to take their word for it, right? We went out in the ocean, we were on these speed boats and I have a bit of a competition thing uh, with me. Uh, I... I tried to sanctify it, but I still got a little bit of competition. So it was two or three people per speedboat, and our guy went out in front of all of us. I thought he was trying to lose us. So I zoomed in front of everyone. I go, he's not going to lose me. Well, I, I, I'm not like, I, I drive cars, you know, I don't drive speedboats. So we hit something, and I felt like we we're about to flip. Now my wife, okay, granted, this is our honeymoon. Like, you don't want to die on your honeymoon, right? My wife, when she's deftly scared, she laughs hysterically. When I am deftly scared, I speak in a third person, okay? So she's laughing hysterically, and I go, oh, my God, this brother's going to die. I'm talking about me. That's what I mean by narrating in a third person. But you know why I did all of that, and I feel like there's something to it. I felt like I am not going to step into a new season of my life leaving the lids from the last season of my life. So maybe if I can describe it in a more clear way, new seasons demands new flows. The lids of the last must be lifted for the latest. Whenever God is going to grow you or you're going to grow spiritually, it will always come down to a choice between a comfort and a risk. Every single time, underscore this. Think about the different times when you had a, a spiritual growth spurt. Your growth will always involve a choice between a comfort and a risk. And if you choose a comfort, you reinforce the lid that's already been over you. But when you choose a risk, you raise the lid, raise the ceiling, lift the lid, and you go into a new place. Can somebody just wave at me if you felt that you had to take some risks over the last two and a half years, hello, COVID-19, right? So here is this scene, and I want to describe it because I think this scene is so important. First of all, Jesus began his very public ministry in Capernaum. This, some of the scholars would tell us, is the headquarters of, of his Galilean ministry. As he's here, he had been in Capernaum previously. I got a chance to go to the Middle East and actually go to Capernaum. And as he was there previously, he walked into a temple, 
And as he walked into the temple, a demoniac manifest, he cast the devil out of a person in church, which kind of is a huh, right? Like, had this guy been to the synagogue before and there wasn't enough anointing in the house to force his hand, and so this guy couldn't get help from anyone else until Jesus came? How many of you know when Jesus comes, he can set you free? When Jesus comes, the things that held you back, held you down, held you out, his anointing destroys yokes. It still does. It sets people free. Right on the heels of that, Peter's mother-in-law was sick with a fever. Jesus heals Peter's mother-in-law, one of his disciples. The word gets out. Many other people are healed. So now we're in kind of this third segment that Jesus walks into this house. When Jesus walks into the house, I love this about Jesus, it's packed out. How many of you know Jesus packed out the house without doing some sort of social media blast? He didn't have to do a TikTok dance. Come on, somebody. He just showed up. Word got out. The dude that cast out devils heals people. This guy is here. They immediately pack it out. Now, a couple thoughts here. First thought that I have is that do you realize that we serve an SRO Jesus? Standing room only Jesus. You don't have to make Jesus more attractive. The, anything you add to the gospel dilutes the gospel. All we've got to do is present raw Jesus and let the Holy Spirit release and loose in the house. Let me tell you what, it would be the best advertisement ever. The other thing that I thought was interesting was who was in attendance. We read it. It says that there were Pharisees, say Pharisees, and teachers of the law they were sitting by. Now, I want to focus in on one thing because I, I just want to hit one strong point and then we want to do some ministry, see what the Lord will do. This phrase, and I love phrases like this, because this phrase is many times the way messages and talks develop for me. I'm reading through the, the Bible and then something just jumps out at me and it begins kind of a series of interrogation, not like hot lamp detective show interrogation, but I start praying over the passage saying, Holy Spirit, what's going on here? And it was a simple phrase, and the presence of the Lord was there to heal them. Them. Now, we're going to talk about it, but a little bit later, four guys unable to walk through the front door, side door, anywhere on the ground floor, has to take their paralyzed friend to the roof, uncover the roof to lower his friend down, he gets healed. Now, let's put these two together. And this is our point of launch. You ready? It says, the present Lord was there to heal them. Say plural. Plural. One guy's let through a roof. He's healed. Say singular. Singular. When the Bible says the presence of the Lord was there to heal them, who is the them? Everybody, including the Pharisees and the Sadducees, Right? Do you ever think sometimes that we can draw erroneous conclusions? We can think that if Jesus wants to heal or if Jesus was here to heal, everyone would be healed. Not in this story, right? He was there to heal, but not everyone positioned and postured themselves for the healing power to impact their life. If the presence of the Lord could be there to heal, the presence of the Lord could be there to deliver. He had it, it, it performed deliverance earlier. If the present Lord is to, there to heal, to deliver, the present Lord is there to save. Present Lord is there for revival. So sometimes I think that we go in services Sunday in, Sunday out, maybe not at Radiant, but many churches in North America, not knowing that the presence of the Lord is there to do something, but we never position ourselves. So watch this. It stayed in a holding pattern. Like I fly in and out of San Francisco, Dan and I flew out of San Francisco today, many times, not necessarily taking off but landing, they'll force planes into holding patterns because San Francisco's known for fog. Anybody's ever been around the Bay Area? And until that fog burns off, you can, my understanding, you can take a plane off in the fog, but you can't land in the fog because you got to see the ground. So they'll put you in a holding pattern. For so long, I think I prayed, and, and, and I love your prayer meeting, and, and I by all means, please pray. That's the number one ministry of the church is worship and prayer, right? But I think I prayed with an erroneous thought. I, I kind of thought I'd pray for revival, and God has revival locked up in a closet of heaven, and that if we pray hard enough, fast enough, he'll crack that closet, the chains are being extended, and a little bit of revival will drop, and then we'll go like 
like 30 years, 60 years, every 500 years in church history there's been a reformation. And those seasons, revival comes, and then if you come in the in-between, you just hope you can have enough residue from the last move to keep you going till you can get your kids into the next move. And the, the conclusion on that statement is categorically false and that revival isn't locked up in a closet. Revival is in a holding pattern waiting for the fog of our hearts to clear to give God a new landing strip that he could come in might, in power, in sovereignty, and supremacy in a new way. So why did it happen? If the presence of the Lord was there to heal them, can we conclude, right, that there had to be some Pharisees and Sadducees that were sick, some Pharisees and Sadducees that needed healing. Why didn't they get it? Now let's jump in this, okay? I'm going to give you a thought on that. The Bible says that the Pharisees and Sadducees, or teachers of the law, they were sitting by. Now, today, American education system, right? College campuses, wherever you're at teaching, with the exception of Zoom school during the past season, right? Teachers stand, students sit. I still do a much university ministry. And even, you know, you might assume that the oldest person in the, in the lecture hall is the prof, not necessarily it may not be. They could be the student. But the person standing up, that's the teacher. The people sitting down, that's the students. But watch this. Flip it. In Jesus' day, teachers sat, students stood. To say, because we're answering the question, can, what short-circuited the move of God in this, in this passage we read in Luke 5? What can short-circuit a move of God or revival? Or how can we facilitate it in our day? Here was the problem, problem number one, right? It says the Pharisees and teachers of the law were sitting by. In other words, they should have been standing, but they were seated, and it seems like Jesus was standing, so what are they saying? Follow me. They're seating, seated, excuse me, because, bottom line, they're unteachable. They're saying we're the teachers, Pharisees, teachers of the law, hello, they're teachers. We're the teachers, and so what? Hinders revival is when we have a know-it-all attitude. Here these jokers are running around thinking they're the smartest person in the room. Come on, somebody. They come in fourth place. Jesus is the smartest person in the room. Second smartest person in the room is the four guys about to open up the lid of the roof and lower their friend down. Third smartest person is the devil because he got more intelligence than you. Even he knows that Jesus has the most intelligence in the room. Pharisees, y'all come in fourth place, right? It's crazy to think that we come to church not realizing that every single service, every single prayer meeting, every single worship moment is an opportunity to discover something new about Jesus. If we ever think that we know it all, if we ever think that we can't hear the simple truths over and over, can I just lovingly tell you that's pride. And God opposes, I got one amen right here, I'm going to preach to this section. That's pride, and God opposes the proud. Everybody smile with me right now. Smile break. All right, back. <laughs> These guys were unteachable. Sometimes that manifests in different ways. I don't think that's the case with the Wednesday night come out to a prayer, so I won't harp on that one. The other thing is I think of when I think of sitting by, and I, and I, I want to say it's, it's, it's one of the minor prophets that talked about that they would be lounging on ivory couches. And I kind of did some research on this, that these Pharisees dudes, they would have unique chairs. I don't know, with someone else's house. I don't know, but they're taking up room sitting down. How many of you know if we can have an occupancy in this room, it would be higher if we all stood up than if we sat down, right? Usually in a hotel room when they have a banquet hall, they'll give you the standing capacity of what the room could hold or the seating capacity. These guys are taking up space, and as they're taking up space, there are people out there that can't get in because they're taking up too much space. Whole nother thought, but I, I begin to realize is there certain attitudes that we can hold on to that's taking up space, that's keeping others from walking in? I, I, I tell you, one of the things that I love about the church when I got saved, I got saved in a Chi Alpha, part of the Home Missions Department, Assemblies of God. It was a university outreach. I got saved, and we went to this Assembly of God church, and, man, these grandmas and these people, they loved on us college students. We didn't know no better. We would walk in, not dressed maybe the way they were dressing back in the, 
you know, that era and stuff, but they loved on us. They would invite us for, for Sunday knowing that we, you, like, you don't have to ask a college student if they're hungry. Although they're a college student, they're always hungry. Feed them, feed them, feed them. And so they would feed us. Uh, when I started interning in this campus ministry, uh, I, I was broke, right? I was broke, broke. They would give me these Pentecostal handshakes and these precious brothers and sisters would have me money. I, I one time come out of my apartment and I'm trying to reach college students. Somebody from the church had left groceries. Their attitude kept me part of the family. And I wonder if we still have that kind of space for people. Is there space in our hearts for people that don't look like us, don't vote like us, don't come from the same side of the tracks as us? Come on, do we have room? Do we have space for folks that look different, think different? Come on, do we have space for that? One of the, oh, come on, come on. One, <laughs> I can go on a tangent, but one of the things that probably broke my heart maybe the most in this last season is that we failed to be kingdom and we became, in some instances, just hear me on this, just hear me on this. In some instances, we had a higher affiliation with a donkey or with an elephant than we did with a lion of the tribe of Judah. And I go, man, if that fills the house, there's some folks out there that aren't going to feel welcome. I'd rather be kingdom. I'm not, you know, are you left-leaning, right-leaning? I don't know if that's that important for me to tell you, but I'm going to tell you what. I'm seated in heavenly places. I'm kingdom-leaning. That's what I'm leaning. I'm leaning on the cross. I'm leaning on the love of Jesus Christ. I'm leaning on the blood of the precious, spotless Lamb of God. End of the day, we got to have space for folks. All right, the other things I think of, you, you heard the phrase, they were on the tiptoe of expectancy. These dudes are sitting back. I wonder if sometimes we come to church expecting the super normal more than we expect the supernatural. Because I believe what short circuits a move is a lack of expectation. We can get you hungry. Let me tell you what. We can get you hungry for the more. Nothing can stop you from experiencing. You know the crisis of our hour. The crisis of our hour is not BA4, BA5, the newest variants of COVID-19. It's not 40-year record highs, inflationary rates, not necessarily with all sensitivity, things going on in Ukraine, things going on in our nation. Uh, there's still the unrest, the division, all that stuff. Can I tell you what I believe the greatest crisis is? The greatest crisis is the gap between our visible reality and what is biblically available. There's something circulating over this house, over this region, and we need some folks that are hungry enough to allow heaven to invade earth through their lives. They're saying, I'm going to live missionally. These guys are not on the tiptoe of expectancy. Come on, I love the way y'all ran up to the altar to worship God. That is the opposite of what was going on in this room. Here is Jesus in the flesh, Emmanuel, and these dudes are sitting back. And which leads me to the third thing. Jesus pointed this one out. He said, why do you reason in your hearts? What was Jesus highlighting? Again, we're addressing the issue of can the presence of the Lord be here to do something and it not get done because we have the wrong posture, right? Sitting back, you're unteachable, right? You were in this, where you're taking up space. You got a whole attitude. You're bringing a whole vibe, right? It's a bad vibe. You're in this place where you're lacking expectancy. You didn't expect to get healed. You didn't expect your friend to get saved. You didn't bring them because you didn't expect it. You came with no expectancy. And now, here is this thing. It says, Jesus rebuked them for reasoning. You know, sometimes I think some people don't realize they're this close to their miracle, but they're so busy reasoning they're not receiving. I'm going to say it to this side over here. I just want a little more help on this side. Jesus rebuked them for reasoning. You ever find out sometimes your mind won't let your heart go free? You hear about the baptism of the Holy Ghost, that God can give you a heavenly language. You hear about the fact that Jesus still performs miracles today. But immediately what we do, and we got to be careful. God did give us a mind, blessed us with a good mind. We ought to use it for the record, okay? He's not calling us to commit intellectual suicide. But understand, the intellectualism of man is pales in comparison to the mind of God. Intellectualism was the wrong tree in the garden. It's the wrong tree now. It's the tree of life that we got to say, Holy Spirit, you're the genius. What do you want to do? And sometimes what the Holy Spirit wants to do, follow me, is counterintuitive. So what happens is we're more led by logic than logos. Logos is the word of God. 
We're more led by calculation than revelation. We, we reason ourselves out of miracles. Like God is about to do something mighty, and I think if we could have an x-ray or we could have some sort of way that we could see in the spirit realm, we saw how close we got, and all of a sudden we jump back on the freeway of trying to figure it out, right? Let me just say this to you. Any God you could figure out, you need to quit serving because that's not the God of the Bible. That's a figment of your imagination. Our God is past finding out. His thoughts are way above our thoughts. We trust him because he's a good God. And when you trust God, let's just let God be God. I remember, man, I'll never forget this, man. I was in, a, I was in Rosario, Argentina, and I was in this uh, huge kind of stadium, this Rodeo place, Rodeo place, not Rodeo. Rodeo is a city by where I live, Rodeo. All right, never mind. Rodeo. <laughs> I was in this rodeo, and this woman that was blind, she comes up to me. She has a stick, primitive stick. She has, I presume, a granddaughter that's leading her and telling her. I was over there with a platform crusade ministry, and they brought me in to speak to young adults. And so the main guy, he was almost like a Reinhard Bonnke known in, in, in Latin America. Uh, he would have these miracle crusades. And, and, you know, she comes up to me. She's blind. When I say blind, she had never seen before. She has white, milky substance. She does not have foreign pupils or irises. She comes up to me. She says, I believe that because you're from America, God is going to use you, and he will heal me. And that, that'll break your heart right there. They believe that we're that favorite because we live in America. Now, I, I'm kind of jesting, but I'm kind of serious right now. She comes to me for prayer that God would not only allow her to see. It's not like she's wearing glasses and she needs to get, well, she's got a stigma, she needs to get back to 2020. No, she's never seen before. I had not seen that kind of miracle before in my ministry, right? If you had a runny nose, come to Brother Smith. I got you, Okay. You got a ringing ear, I'm your man. Come on, I'm going to pray for it. We're going to get that ring out your ear and that run out your nose right now. Come on. But I didn't have no kind of anointing. She comes to me, and so this is, this is awesome. If I can get someone to come to the keys. I'm looking around for someone that has some anointing. Isn't this funny? I, I said, no story. I'm looking, I'm, I'm like, oh, hold on a second. I've got like a teenage Argentine gal. She's walking through the crowd. We're just praying for people. She's my interpreter, right? And so I'm, I'm trying to find someone, and guess what? God allowed it to be the case where I couldn't find anyone. Your growth will always come down to a choice between a comfort and a risk. I was looking for my comfort blanket. Okay, where are you at, man? There's somebody that really knows how to pray for the sick. Couldn't find anyone. I couldn't turn this lady away. So I closed my eyes, which my recommendation to you, if you ever pray for someone out on the street, keep your eyes open, right? Close my eyes. I'm not even praying right. I'm like, oh, God, please touch her eyes. I pray, God, and, and, and Lord, help her get home safely and help her granddaughter. Like, you ever, like, pray long enough that you hope that people forget why they came to you for prayer in the first place because you don't want to let them down and you don't think you're really, okay, I, no one can relate to that. It's just me, all right? So I got my eyes closed. I'm praying, get her home safely, Lord. Let, let the taxi cab driver be honest. And, you know, I'm praying stupid stuff. And so finally at the end, I knew, okay, I got I to at least pray for it. So I said, Lord, touch your eyes. When I said that, no exaggeration. I mean, if, if I stop, I could begin to weep right now because this is like it was yesterday. This woman screams. She begins to go, me holes, me holes, my eyes, my eyes, my eyes, my eyes. And all of a sudden, remember, my eyes are closed, and I'm praying for her. But when she screamed, I screamed. Like, I was, I was praying. No, true story. I screamed like a teenage girl, come on, at a K-pop concert. Come on, with BTS, or whatever, them little Korean pop, little cute guys. All right. So I got an interpreter. So I'm praying. The interpreter is interpreting. She may respond. The interpreter is interpreting. So how many of you know, we skipped all interpreters. She went, ah! And I went, ah! The reason why I screamed, she scared me. But I opened my eyes in time enough to see this white, milky substance become these beautifully formed hazel eyes right before my eyes. <laughs> to this day, I sat in my hotel room in Rosario, Argentina, almost all night looking at the Bible, looking at the ceiling, looking at the Bible, and I just said, God, you really do do this stuff. And I felt like the Lord spoke to me, and I felt like he said, Son, I am removing the luxury of you believing in things you've not believed for. It's one thing to say we believe in healing, but are we believing for healing? 
It's one thing that we say we believe in the empowerment of the Spirit, but are we believing for the empowerment of the Spirit? It's one thing to say we believe in Jesus' ability to set you free, but are we believing for someone's deliverance? You know what I love about these four dudes, and I do close. Give me two minutes and we're done. This is perfect. Except for my water. <laughs> While these jokers are in there, and here is this holding pattern of healing power. These four guys bring their friends from some distance away. We're not told. They try to go in the front room, or front door, excuse me. It's too crowded. They can't even get there. There's a crowd outside the door. I presume they went around the building. They probably went through the back, can't get in. And all of a sudden, one of these dudes had the idea. I love it. We need to take it to the roof. I could just see that moment, right? You know what? It tells me what type of Christian you are when you hit an obstacle in life. These dudes could have said, hey, man, we can't get in on the first floor. Let's just turn around and take Bob back. His name's not Bob, and I'm going to call him Bob. We're going to take Bob back, man. We just couldn't get in. We'll try to catch him on his next tour when he comes back. Hopefully he'll come back. These dudes tore up in the roof. You go, what, what's so big about that? It wasn't their roof. You go tear up. They, I, get, I don't know how they got up there. You know, sometimes they may have steps. It doesn't say it does. I don't know. I'm thinking a couple of dudes climbed up there. They wrapped rope around their friends like cotton. And three of them dudes is pulling one dude. I don't know how they did it, but they found a way to get their friend up there. And the Bible said they began to pull the roof. Now, here's what I'm saying. In order for there to be a breakthrough, this is a picture of a breakthrough. Because when they break in, they don't just uncover the truth. Watch this. People who weren't at the party, late to the party, came to show folks what was always at the party. Healing has always been here. It didn't just start when I got here. Healing has always been here. It just hasn't found a landing strip. There just haven't been people hungry enough. There have been people that have had, you know, the, the safety wheels, safety valves on their, on their spiritual bicycles. Take the safety valve. They've stayed in the kiddie pool when it's time to go to the deep end. That I believe that God is putting a hunger for more in people. And this hunger for more is so, so, uh, the, the tipping point between scripture's manifestation between being the written word and our manifested reality is a relentless desperate cry for the more of God we can get some folks that will have a desperate relentless I threw that word in it's significant relentless means I'm not just going to be hungry sometimes I want to live hunger I want to live desperate for the more of God and what happens when you get an entire church of folks radiant like that then all of a sudden then the outbreaks of God begin to happen and you're not even trying. You're not like you just open up an atmosphere, boom, and worship. Come on, hope in the team and somebody gets healed. Somebody over there and they're, they're, they're emailing pastor and the prayer team. Oh man, we got healed. Oh man, we brought our son here. He got delivered. Hey, Amen. This And it just starts to happen. I've seen it. I've, I've tasted it. I've seen it. Here are these guys and they lower their friend down and what they did is they pulled back the roof but they uncovered the truth. The truth is Jesus Wherever Jesus is at, there's healing, there's deliverance, there's revival. He brings it all with him. Final thought, and we're going to close our eyes. Final thought is this. I was challenged by this passage in closing, right? I was challenged. That's false comfort when a speaker says in closing. No, but I really mean it in closing. This whole passage really challenged me in this way. I thought, what kind of mentality these four dudes got? And, and you know what I realized? There is, in certain areas, I've traveled all across this nation and over other nations, and I, and I find out that there is a common faith. Now, listen to what I'm saying. When I'm saying common faith, I mean common to Christians. I mean church-going Christians. I mean people that believe the Bible. That if you go to L.A., there's a certain type of Christianity that's common amongst Los Angeles. I live up in the Bay Area, Northern California. There's a certain type. You go to Texas. I go to Texas a lot. Minister, there's a faith. You come to Arizona, right? And you know what I realize? Roof raising, What maybe I'll say it better. Roof raising, right, reformers and barrier-breaking believers are not common faith Christians. Like, whatever is the common faith here, it takes uncommon faith to open up and to break through into other realms. That's why revivalists, and, and I had time, I could tell you about, you know, the W.J. Seymour's. I could tell you about, uh, man, different people that throughout history, uh, uh, 
Peggy and Christine Smith. I can talk about Evan Roberts. I can talk to many, many others. But there's somebody that's got to do something that other people wouldn't do. In other words, these people are ready to take it to the roof. And I believe that God is saying in this hour, this is an incredible hour. I believe we're going to see an increase of the Holy Ghost. And if I could say it, it sounds crazy, but it doesn't to this group. Them old cartoons. I mean, you remember them old? Remember when cartoons only came on Saturday morning or a little bit after school? You didn't have 24 hours. I don't even know what I'd have done as a kid. You had 24-hour channel programming, cartoon, cartoon network. What? I had to get up early in the morning and see my Scooby-Doo. Like, I don't know about you, right? I don't even know where I was going with that. I just threw that out there. I don't know what I was going with. I feel like in this hour right now, what is the regularly scheduled kind of programming has to be in this point in time put back on a shelf and say this isn't a normal season in the body of Christ. God is wanting to not just do something that it's Saturday morning programming, but that you're just ready. We have our programs, no doubt. As, as church people, I speak in church, great friends of mine, my heroes are pastors, we got programs. But I always pray for one Holy Spirit deviation where the Holy Spirit, come on, Phoenix, Arizona Cardinals, right? Where the quarterback Holy Ghost can come up to the pulpit and call an audible in worship and call an audible. And I believe more of those are going to happen. And we got to be willing to say there's something here. There's something here. Would you bow your heads? Jesus, Lord, I thank you, God, for this house. I thank you for the amazing believers all over this place. I just pray, God, right now, as this prayer meeting tonight, Jesus, you would show up and show off. With your heads bowed and eyes closed, I know this is a believer's meeting. I know the, the tendency at a Wednesday night prayer meeting is that there would be people that know the Lord. Why else would you come to Wednesday night? But I also know that it's quite possible that someone loved a friend, a family member enough where they called you and said, hey, why don't you come out? And you maybe have to work on weekends, but you made your way out on this Wednesday night. And I believe it's strategic. You didn't just come here and fall in this place by accident. You were Holy Ghost subpoenaed. I say that because my, 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 for jury duty, my, my wife is, was not necessarily subpoenaed, but she was kind of subpoenaed, right? If you're here right now, you're not right with Jesus. You don't know if you were to pass where you go. Let me just say this, first of all, because I think this is so important. Like, Jesus, the Bible says, taste and see that the Lord is good. Jesus wants to give you a taste of heaven to go to heaven on, just like the devil wants to give you hell to go to hell on. It really is a no-brainer that C.S. Lewis made it easy for evangelists. He basically said the fact that your heart yearns for what earth cannot supply is proof that heaven must be your home. You hunger for something that you that doesn't have an expiration date on it. You hunger for something for love that lasts, a joy that doesn't dry up the morning after the party. You want a peace that far exceeds the range of your medications that you've taken for anxiety. You want what Jesus alone can give you. And let me say something. The expiration date isn't just on your carton of milk and your loaf of bread. It's unseen on every single thing around us except the Word of God in your soul. And when the two come together, something eternal was birthed. If you're here right now and people say, why should I give my life to the Lord? And my response is, why shouldn't you? You're around people. You Somebody used to do drugs. Somebody used to cut themselves around you. Somebody used to cheat on their spouse. Somebody was a bad hombre and probably would have jumped you not that far. But Jesus came in their life. There was this one apologist and this one dude was arguing. This guy apologist is like a guy that argues for the truths and principles of Christianity. And this other dude who was an atheist, he was arguing with him. He says, it makes no difference. Christianity doesn't make a difference. And so he had a genius thought. He says, okay, you walk out into a dark alley and five big dudes, I mean, yat it, not just tatted, yat it up, back up out of a dark door. You're in an alley surrounded by the five dudes. He said to him, would it make a difference to you to know they just came out of a Bible study or they just came out of crystal meth lab? The other atheists didn't want to give any credence to the argument. Everybody clapped and applauded because deep down inside, we do know Christianity makes a difference because Jesus does. If you're here right now, you're not right with God. You don't know if you're to die where you go. Jesus loves you so much. He already took the price of your sin upon him. It will cost you something. You got to repent. You have to surrender your life, but you're getting a better end of that exchange. If you're right now, you say, Sean, pray with me. I need to give my life to Christ. I need to come back to the Lord. If that's you, wherever you're at right now, slip your hand 
up right now. Slip it up wherever you're at. Say, Sean, pray me. Yes, 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 yes. Amen. God bless you. Come on. Yes, yes. Amen. Yes. Back there. I probably see about seven or eight hands. Anybody else? This is awesome. Yes. Nine hands. Come on. This is awesome. Ten. Come on. Eight more hands. This is amazing for Wednesday night. Can I get everyone? Amen. I love you, Radiant. Can I get everyone that just lifted their hand? Would you stand if you just lifted your hand? You're saying, I'm making a commitment to Christ, or you're saying, I'm rededicating. Because it could be a case that you've been kind of prodigal, you need to come home. Come on, tonight's homecoming. If you lift, hand up, stand up. Would you do that right now? All those people that lifted their hand, would you stand up? Amen. Amen, amen, amen. Yes. Yes, amen, amen. Yes, amen. Back there, yes. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Yes. I want to pray with you right where you stand is awesome. If you would remain standing, remain standing. If you would just remain standing for a second, we're going to pray for you. If you're around someone standing, would you just put a hand on her shoulder, just let them know. And uh, my sister, straight back in the back there, uh, yes, yes, back there. Right now, it's pretty evident that you're being touched of the Lord, but but let me tell you something. I, I when To say that a weight just lifted, I can't even begin to describe that because what God is doing is not just in you, it's in your family. And I just saw as you stood, something literally broke off you, but there was a domino effect in your family. And if you need scripture for this, anybody here, I'm a big Bible person. In Acts, when Paul saw a Philippian jailer come to know the Lord, Paul said to him, you and your household will be saved. I believe the word of the Lord for you is salvation is about to run through your house and God is going to begin to literally show his love, show his grace. I even see some young ones really getting impacted by the Lord. And I don't know if that's nieces and nephews. I don't know. I can't see that close. I don't know if you're old enough to have kids. But something's going on even with a younger generation. So it's awesome. All of you that are standing, let's all pray together, fam. Would you all pray with me? Let's say this together. Say, Lord Jesus. Come on, say it with me, fam. Lord Jesus, I confess you. Lord of my life, I believe in my heart, God raised you from the dead. Lord, I repent. I turn to you. I thank you, Jesus, that you love me, you've forgiven me, and I am a child of God, and I have victory over the enemy, and I will serve you all my days in Jesus' name. Now, you don't have to pray this. Let me pray this for you. Amen. Father, I ask you to seal your love over every single person that stood. I ask you to break off, Lord, anything that the enemy has used in the way of a lie, in the way of an argument, in the way of some sort of bondage. We ask that, Lord, right now that you would break that off of them. We just speak freedom, clarity in their mind, and God, a love in their hearts. And that, Lord, we just thank you, Jesus that God, that this is truly a sign, just like my sister, you're doing something in the entire family, and we give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Awesome.